Welcome to Real Estate Investing Abundance, the show for busy, fulfilled professionals like you to learn how to develop financial independence built on solid, passive real estate investments. Now, here is your host, Dr. Alan Lomax. Hello, Dennis, and welcome uh, back to Real Estate Investing Abundance. Uh, Dennis is a veteran of our show, and you can catch his previous episode on number 135. So Dennis, uh, just take us into the show today and tell us what we should be looking for in an income fund. Well, first off, thanks for having me on again. I really appreciate it. Enjoyed the first time I was here. I really enjoyed uh, coming back here. So I think today's an interesting environment where a lot of investors are seeking income, but at the same time, this is probably the highest income that they they could get in a really long time from a savings account or a CD account. Uh, so just today, I actually had this conversation where someone said, you know, should I still look at some of these private equities because I could I could get a you know a guaranteed five percent through a bank and what I told them for is is basically okay. this when you're looking at private equities versus uh, some of these investments that you could do by parking your money in a bank you have to understand that right now you're probably getting peak rates a lot of these regional banks that are giving these really high rates they're doing it to keep their um, their capital preserved right now because they don't want to run on the bank because they you can you see a bank what's happened with some of these other banks like New York City Community Bank, you know, Silicon Valley Bank before that is these runs basically take out the bank. Uh so the way that they're preserving these runs is by giving these really really high interest rates and these interest rates are causing problems when they report their earnings uh to the stockholders. So those 5-6% interest teaser rates that you see on CDs those are very, very temporary. Now, if the interest rates, if the inflation rate re accelerates, which this is a possibility, you know, we're April 25th and the last couple of data points have been going the other way. If it re accelerates, that's going to be a different story. But as of right now, I think a lot of investors are being fooled that they can get long term five, six percent interest rates. And that's probably not the case versus where you can still get eight, nine, ten percent on a good income fund. You just have to make sure what's inside the income fund is safe, it's sound, it's tied to an asset, it's collateralized, um, The that the fund manager is not taking any unnecessary risks. Uh, those are the things that you kind of have to look at. We are, you know, we follow along other projects and there's a lot of projects out there that are stopping distributions. Uh, so those are the things like don't get blinded and see like, oh, I can make an extra percentage point or two percentage points. But what good does that do if that puts your capital at risk or that puts you in a situation where you invest today and three months later, they stop the distributions because they can't maintain that distribution. So that would be the first thing I would I would say is be mindful of who the operator is, what the collateral is in the fund. And sometimes and I, I've been saying this a lot the last six to nine months, sometimes take the percentage or two less and just go into a safer deal. Uh, you won't regret it you know, when things go bad. Well, explain to us what is an income fund uh, and how does that differ from actually investing in a syndication or directly in a property? That's a great question. So an income fund basically is a fund that's sole purpose is to create a certain amount of cash flow for its investors. Um, usually, you know, they have a mandate which they spell out in their private placement memorandum where they say they will be they will be investing in, you know, asset A, B, C, and D. Like, for example, our income fund, we invest in uh, multifamily, but we also do a lot of private lending inside the fund to generate the higher yield. Um, so we state out the assets that we could invest in. And then we put together, you know, a fund where deal by deal, those deals sole mission is to provide that cash flow for that income fund versus an individual deal, your profit potential is tied directly into the performance of that one deal. So if that one deal buyers their property manager or uh, has a fire on site, then your distributions most likely will stop versus an income fund. If it's structured correctly, uh, it's a whole portfolio that goes into creating that yield for you. 
And you, you've already mentioned some of the things that we need to look out for uh, in terms of when we're looking at income funds. Can you go into uh, a little more detail, a little more specifics as to what we should be specifically concerned about when looking into a fund? So yeah, let's let's kind of go high, more high level, and not just the income fund, growth fund, just in general, like what you should be looking for when you invest in a fund. Uh, so these are the things that I've learned over you know ten years of investing in funds before I ever created my own fund. It was a make sure you understand if it's a closed ended fund or an evergreen fund. Uh, they are very very different. A closed ended fund is a set time period. And money cannot go in and out of the fund. So basically, if you're a closed-ended fund for $5 million or $10 million, once you raise the 5 to $10 million, you deploy it, then once those deals go full cycle, it's returned, the fund ends. Uh, the alternative is this ever evergreen fund model, which there are some great operators out there that are um, evergreen. It's a lot simpler. It's one fund. But the problem with my problem with evergreen funds is that money goes in and out. And what ends up happening is... When I was researching for my book, The Alternative Investment Almanac, I've learned that evergreen funds, unfortunately, had a higher percentage of Ponzi schemes than regular closed-ended funds. And the reason was because money wasn't necessarily tied into a specific asset. So for example, if someone invests in our income fund and invests $100,000, we usually have that $100,000 allocated to a certain investment that we're going to make. And there's a there's a clear connection between money coming in and an asset purchased for that same amount of money. Evergreen fund, it's not like that. It could be $100,000 comes in today. Tomorrow, an investor wants some of their money back. You, you could give them the money back. So you'll see a lot more liquidity in evergreen funds. But the problem is with evergreen funds is once the music chairs kind of stop, you are not going to be able to get out when things kind of get bad. So those are the kind of things that you want to look out for. Uh, the other things in a fund, just make sure that the uh, the expenses that are being charged are industry standard. Uh, you know, there's a certain amount you charge for an as asset management fee. There's a certain much uh, that would be for like a capital transaction fee. Uh, you want to look at because those fees can really can take a lot of the returns uh, potential for the investor. Other things to be mindful of, and we've seen this in a, I don't know, I think this was a specific deal last year, was the operator's background. Uh, we saw one deal where it was three lawyers and they put together this deal and they had a, like a clause in their in their fund documents that basically said that they could do some of the legal work for the fund. Uh, the problem is they were their current legal professional. They they were making like six, seven, eight hundred dollars an hour, and in reality, they could have probably got the work done for a lot cheaper through a regular SEC attorney. So those are the things to be mindful of. The fund protects the actual investor without unnecessary expenses, um, and then just be comfortable with what that fund is actually investing in. There was a, a series of funds in the last 24 to 36 months that turned into being Ponzi schemes. And they were derivatives of investments that people kind of thought they understood, but they really didn't. Uh, and I think this was a direct result of the environment that we found ourselves in, uh, because in from 2018 to 2022, until the rates started going up, almost every single investment that people made in the private equity world was successful. The interest rates were going down. If you bought multifamily, you probably saw a 20 to 30% return. And then people, I think, got a little bit over, overly confident. And then they started investing in other assets that they didn't fully understand because multifamily is a very simple asset to understand. Um, so we saw things that were derivatives of the oil and gas space or derivatives of a debt space. And unfortunately, people saw the returns. It felt like a regular syndication or fund. And then in reality, they didn't really understand what, what the asset was that they were actually investing in. And those didn't pan out very, very well in the last like two years or so. Well, yeah, it sounds like uh, an evergreen fund could certainly get uh, really quite confusing with funds just coming in and going out and having no uh, specific tie to any tangible uh, asset uh, there. What is the percentage out there in income funds uh, as closed-ended to opposed to evergreen funds? That I'm not sure. Uh, just from like high level, from seeing 
you know, d- different funds presented to me, I would say it's usually half. Usually the bigger established names go evergreen. It's it's a lot less instead of going ahead and doing a new fund every single year, they would just have like a permanent fund. You know, again, it, it's no indication. It's not that every ever, evergreen fund is a Ponzi scheme. It's just something to be mindful of when you do invest to know that, hey, it's a closed end fund or evergreen fund. And just being able to also taking a look at the balance sheets and the profit and losses and being able to understand it. Uh, the problem is sometimes when funds get too big, when you look at those those spreadsheets, it's really hard to decipher what is what. You know, how much money is in the assets, how much money is actually owed to the investors, everything like that. There is a certain benefit, like our income fund is pretty small and there's a benefit because you could look at that, you know, that, that P&L and you could understand in 30 seconds what's going on in that fund. Uh, so just make sure you kind of have that understanding when you are looking at these spreadsheets on some of these bigger uh, bigger funds. You you kind of have to get past the fancy marketing that you kind of see out there and actually do some uh, due diligence on these funds. I'm sure in, in the documents, the disclosures and, uh, and so on and so forth that they are going to tell us whether they're uh, Closed-ended or evergreen fund, I guess. It, is it explicitly spelled out, or is it usually? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And where, where specifically do we usually find that? Uh, it, it'll be in the private placement memorandum. It'll be very, very clear. Usually, the, they'll in the description they'll use the words evergreen or or closed-end funded. Will usually just have a date, a sunset date, where the fund is due to kind of go full cycle at that point. Uh, So those are the triggers like sunset date, evergreen, you'll see those keywords within the font. You'll also see it in the marketing docs. That is something most securities attorneys will insist that's very clear on the investment summary. Uh, So it's usually not, not hidden. It's just people don't want to, even if it's right in front of them, they sometimes just want to invest with certain people. And if that's the case, they're willing to overlook some of the um, some of the dangers, I guess, of investing in potentially an evergreen fund. Uh, but then again, there's some really great evergreen fund managers, and you know, I, I don't want to throw them under the bus because they are really good at what they do. But unfortunately, some people are not with that uh, space. In your fund, you you have both traditional as well as alternative uh, investments. And I'm assuming that is for diversification, but are there other reasons that you try to have both traditional and alternative vehicles in your fund? So we we don't actually have any traditional uh, investments in our, our fund, but our, alter- our fund is designed to complement someone that does have traditional assets in their portfolio. Um, we're a firm believer, you know, I've, I've invested in stocks, uh, since I was 14 years old, so over 22 years now. And I think stocks and in general, more stocks, especially a low cost, a low cost index funds can be great equity builders over time. The problem with them is that they produce really crappy cash flow. For example, you know, right now the, the yields are on the 2%. So you would always, if you just invested in traditional index funds, you would you would always have this pressure to sell if you have to retire or or need the income. That's where we believe that if you have a portion there and then you take an income fund that's just geared towards alternative investments whose sole focus is to produce cash flow, they complement each other really, really well because you're going to get the appreciation and equity on the, uh, on the traditional side and then you're going to get the cash flow on the alternative side. Well, social media is certainly a big deal these days and becoming more and more so in real estate. And you use LinkedIn. So how do you suggest that we utilize uh, LinkedIn to educate ourselves and to learn uh, the language of real estate investing? Yeah, that's a a great question. So what, what I found out when I look back at my career in real estate, I realized that a lot of calls that I was taken on LinkedIn that initially I kind of thought was a waste of time. I had to relook at how I was looking at them. Uh, the bottom line is when you're getting started, it's very, very important to understand that you need some kind of base of knowledge before you really dive into 
real estate. Too many people just say like, oh, just go to a meetup or go to an event. The problem is if you go to an event and you don't understand what's being said at the event, or you don't understand what a cap rate is or an NOI is, you're going to come off as looking very, very needy. And you're not going to make any sincere relationships because you're just going to be coming off and just asking a lot of questions. Uh, so the time to really get that entry level education, I think is on LinkedIn. So one shortcut I found was if you just go in your profile and underneath your name, just put in an investor or or multifamily investor or self-storage investor or Bitcoin investor. It doesn't really matter what you want to actually invest in. It just put the words there. And what's going to happen is you're going to be sought out for these calls because they are they have they have uh, assistants that basically go through these profiles. And if they see the word investor in, they'll try to schedule a call with you. Yes, some of them are going to be promotional. Most of them are going to be a waste of time. But what's going to help you is you're going to get on a call with someone for 20, 30 minutes in the industry, and they're going to use lexicon that you're not going to be familiar with. And what you should do after that call is really figure out what was said. And until you really get into a situation where you can go after call after call and really understand what these people are saying, that's when you start going to these meetups because now you have the language. Now you're not just going to go there and ask a thousand million questions. You're going to go there and you're going to speak the same language as the people that are there. And that's going to you know, progress your career uh, versus not getting on any calls and not ever learning the basics of real estate. Enlightened investors, if you haven't done so already, be sure and click that like button and also click that share so others can take advantage of the content. And finally, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single one of our upcoming episodes. What suggestions do you have for us to really start building a network when we are starting from zero? Yeah, so the first step is that that LinkedIn step. The second step then is to actually go to the meetups now. Now that you actually understand what's going on, you go to the meetups. And then my my kind of shortcut with building a network is that when you go to the meetups and if there's a relationship there and there's a good connection, make sure that you get on the calendar with them uh, going forward. So I found that there's a big difference between saying something like, hey, look forward to catching up to you or, or B saying like, hey, next month so we're in april right now hey my, may 17th you have some time around noon let's just get together for a 30 minute call is that okay with you and then doing those calendar invites and then what i do is if it's a good call then you would say something like hey would you want to follow up in another quarter i want to know what's going on in your thing i'll let you know what's my thing um if you do that consistently with five to ten people you will have all the network that you really need because if you are if you are interested in real estate investing and you get on a call with five people, five to 10 people every single quarter, and you hear what's going on in their investments, and you tell them what's going on in your investment, your knowledge will 5x over that one year period. Uh, so those are the things that I really think it, I, it's step by step. The first step is get educated, learn learn some of the language, then go to these meetups, and then don't, don't be lazy on the follow-ups with some of these people that you do connect with. Make sure you get things on calendar. Make sure that every quarter you can at least get some of them. Quarterly is too much. Every every half year, and as long as those people are willing to make that investment in you, you should be able to make that investment with them. Well, what about uh, starting investment clubs? Once you uh, start developing your network, are investment clubs worth developing, and uh, what are the advantages, the disadvantages of doing so? And how would we get started in developing an investment club? So investment clubs are, you know, it, it was one of the biggest tools I used in my career. Private equity is not cheap. Most of the minimum investments are usually between fifty to hundred thousand dollars. So when I was going to some of these networking events, I would meet some people that expressed interest of possibly going into these deals together. Um, we ended up forming a club of three people. We agreed to doing deals together. Instead of us having a minimum of 50,000, we would have uh, you know, a minimum of 16,667 uh, 16, if you split it three ways. Uh, so what ends up happening is instead of doing one deal, you could end up doing 10 deals or 12 deals and getting that amount, amount that getting that amount of information really shortcuts the learning process on what deals do well, what deals don't do well. 
Um, so those are the things that I think an investment club really helps with. In reality, it's just an LLC. Uh, you have an operating agreement. The main thing to keep in mind with that is that you have to make sure everybody stays active. Uh, because if one person of that LLC no longer is active in the decision making, then you've created a security. So you got to make sure it's you're making this investment club with other people that will participate. And then it's just as simple as creating an LLC, creating a bank account for the LLC, and then investing together on projects that you guys approve. Um, the other way to do an investment club is obviously just to do the club as a high level, but then the individuals in that club would invest separately. And there's plenty of those groups out there. Again, it's a, very, a little bit different. Each each has its pros and cons, uh, but it can be as simple as just an LLC with a business LLC um, formation. So an investment club, from your perspective, is an LLC, and everyone in that LLC has got to be an active partner in that. Otherwise, you're going to face uh, S, uh, SEC regulation breaches. Is Did I understand that correctly? Yes. So anytime you do any LLC and a member of that LLC is not actively involved, it, it it falls into SEC territory. So you do have to be very careful. There's a lot of misconceptions out there when it comes to that. But again, I'm not an SEC attorney. This is what I've learned uh, when when my group did speak to uh, various attorneys about this. And the funny part is you will get different advice between talking to a regular attorney and then talking to an SEC attorney. It is very, it's day and night. Make sure you talk to an SEC attorney if you have security questions and not a regular attorney. So another question, if you are in an investment club, an LLC, and uh, you're investing a 506C, does everybody in that club, uh, do they have to be accredited investors? Yes. So if you're invited, so that is, so some people try to do a workaround where one member of the LLC is accredited and then they, but no, you are checking off a box that the whole, that everybody in the LLC is actually accredited. The other way to do it is if that LLC holds a certain amount of assets, I believe it's 5 million, then it automatically becomes like an accredited. But again, you, it, there's no shortcuts. You don't want to you know, get into SEC world and you don't want to get the operator in trouble by submitting that only one member of the LLC is actually accredited. Uh, so just be, be careful with that. Yeah. Well, how is investing in affordable housing? How does that differ uh, from the traditional value and uh, commercial real estate investing? So that's something our company kind of focuses on, SIH Capital Group. Uh, besides the income fund that we kind of mentioned before, we do do affordable housing where some people think of it as Section 8, but we do it at affordable housing at scale. So it's very, very different. Uh, the way I always describe affordable housing is that if you have a raw piece of land, it's surprisingly similar to build a beautiful Class A building than... And it's surprisingly similar to build a class A building and build an affordable housing building. So a lot of times the you still have to run a foundation there. You still have to run utilities there. You have to run a roof, um, windows, all of that. What, what changes is that last mile is that you probably would do higher end finishes for the class A building. So given that that's the case, not a lot of developers or builders would ever build affordable because they would just always make the, the building a class A or a class B, a B plus. Um, so the way that the government subsidizes is with these LIHTC credits. And these LIHTC credits basically allow the developer to build substantially cheaper, which allows the property to be affordable. There's these two 15-year restrictions that usually come along with the property. We like to buy in the second 15-year restriction. What ends up happening is a lot of the tax credits are phased out. However, they still have to be compliant uh, with a lot of the income restrictions uh, so we come in at that point. There's a lot of incentive for us to buy it because now we have a phase out period. We know when that property can go market. Um, we have vouchers that stay with the property. So if if we have a bad tenant, we have leverage over them where we can we can evict them and the voucher actually stays with the property. And it's actually it's one of the only niches in real estate that we feel like there's 
truly a, 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 um, a barrier of entry and not everybody can get into it because you have to understand the compliance. Uh, like we have our own property management affordable. We have our own affordable housing property management division that allows us to get to be approved for a lot of these um, transactions quicker because we have that in-house uh, so there's there's a lot of things about it that we really, really love. Everything from the barrier of entry to the fact that we have a exit plan already in place day one when they go market. And then it's just a huge need in this country that's that's not going anywhere for the foreseeable future. Well, what is the benefit of investing with partners that are operators uh, rather than just cap raisers? Yeah, so we don't have any capital raises in our general partnership teams. Everybody is always very, very involved. Um, for affordable housing, it's uh, me and two partners. One of the partners oversees the property management company. The other partner, basically me and him, asset to manage it. And um, what they, I think the industry in the last two, three years has gone way on the other side where capital raising, where people are supposed to have roles on the project and they really don't. And we've seen very sad stories with, with those situations where people are just doing too many deals that they can't efficiently operate. Uh, so you you have to understand your operational team, understand everybody that's involved, uh, understand how much money everybody's put in. We've had in, we have had some of our investors actually ask us for personal financial statements before investing. And at first I was a little taken back. And then I just thought it was a great idea. Like why, if they're willing to spend 50 to $100,000 with you, why not be able to show them what you're financially worth? And I think too often we skip those steps and they're just so critical in the due diligence process. So what are the two most common misconceptions about investing in real estate syndication? The first one is how passive it is. So this is something that I, I have arguments all the time with, not arguments, but uh, professional disagreement with what's being marketed out there. Uh, so when you wire the funds, it is very, very passive as an LP after that. However, the process to get to the point where you're wiring the funds, to me, is a very active involvement. You really need to develop a relationship with the with the operator. You need to make check with your network what their experiences are with that operator. You need to actually look at the deal. You need to look at the the um, the high level of the deal. You need to underwrite the deal yourself. Doing all that, all those steps, I consider very, very active. And too many people say, well, it's so easy. You get an operator you love, then you could just wire and you sit back and you get mailbox money. And that's all great, except when a deal goes bad, you look back at it, you're the only one to blame because you didn't do the proper due diligence in that deal. So the first misconception I think is just how passive it is. It's mark. I think it's overly marketed out there. Uh, I like to use the word actively passive. That makes a lot more sense to me where it's active and then there's a point and then there's it's passive. And until you, know, you hit that point, then you're kind of speculating at that point because if you're not actively involved in the due diligence, you're basically speculating on the investment. Now, on the on the other the um, the other misconception is how tax friendly commercial real estate can be, and I think the words, I think what what ends up happening is the operators don't do a good enough job explaining what depreciation recapture is, and the fact that the tax bill will come later, except it's getting deferred. So I I like the fact that when operators actually say the word tax deferred versus uh, tax friendly, because tax friendly is implying that, you know, you're never gonna have to pay money on these taxes. And it's not true. It's it's tax deferred where until the sale of the property where you recapture the depreciation, yes, it is pretty tax friendly. Usually the distributions are somewhat tax friendly during the year. Um, and then the other big one with the taxes is explaining to someone the fact that this is considered passive losses and not active losses. Uh, so many times, you know, we've had investors who reach out and they're like, oh, great, I'm going to get this negative $30,000 tax, uh, I mean, loss on my Schedule K. But but do you have passive income? Because if you don't, you, it's it's just going to get suspended. So those are the things that I think um, people like to use certain um, marketing hot topics without fully explaining that there is an alternative side to that. 
We are talking today with Dennis uh, Shapiro, and he is with SIH Capital Group uh, dot com. Uh, Dennis is the author of the Alternative Investment Almanac and Experts Insights on Building Personal Wealth in Non Traditional Ways. So, Dennis, tell us about SIH Capital Group and tell us about your book, The Alternative Investment Almanac. Yeah, thank you, Alan. Uh, so I'll start off with the book. You know, I wrote the book because we were in a lot of different alternative investments besides multifamily. We were investors in mobile home parks, self-storages, ATM funds. Um, and we want to write a book that really encompasses multiple asset classes, has the same structure. So when you read a chapter, you'll read a chapter only about mobile home parks. And then it goes into two Q&A sections with investors in that in that field. And then the very next chapter is going to be self-storage and it's going to be the same exact structure. I go over the pros and cons of the asset class. I go over a section I call the bad apples where people who've been convicted of Ponzi schemes in the space, what characteristics of them. So it's, I'm trying not to shine only the positives of the asset class, but both. And then the cool part is the Q and A is actually the same for every single one of these investors, even if it's mobile home parks or self storages. So you kind of see their take on the industry, where they see the industry. And the goal was for someone who may not have much background and never invested in one of these alternative investments, they could read a book, see nine different asset classes, and then from that book, then go ahead and deep dive and say, you know what, I really like the mobile home park chapter. I'm going to learn more about mobile home parks. So I'm going to go listen to a mobile home park po podcast. Or, you know, I really, I really was digging the, the multifamily. That, that looks like that's the right asset class for me. Now I'm going to go in and dig in on that versus picking up a book and spending three hours on an asset class and then saying, you know, this isn't right for me. So I wanted to abridge that process. So that's what the book, uh, I felt like the book accomplished. Uh, so the book, The Alternative Investment Almanac, Expert Insights on Building Personal Wealth in Non-Traditional Ways, can be found on Amazon. And then our company, SIH Capital Group, a capital with an A, um, we we were founded a little bit before COVID. The, our structure is that we have an income fund and then we have individual deals. Um, we might do one deal, two deals a year. So that's kind of different from what's out there. We are very, we usually underwrite for holding about 10 years for the property, which makes the underwriting a little bit harder. But we feel that if we get the right financing in place to hold the property for five to 10 years, our investors are just going to be in such a better shape. And then the last thing is we don't have any investor relations person. It's just, it's me and my partner. Um, it, it's really just about us. We don't have no salary. So we're not doing this uh we're not we're not doing deals just to do deals we're really just slow steady and we love building relationships with our investors and our communities that we operate in well dennis it has been a pleasure having you back with us again today and once again we were visiting with dennis shapiro at sih capital group uh, dot com thank you dennis for being with us today Alan, thank you so much for having me again. Appreciate it. Enlightened investors, wait, wait, don't go just yet. I just want to remind you about our recently launched webinar that you will not want to miss. If you're at all curious and would like to learn more about how real estate investing can diversify your investment portfolio, alleviate the anxiety associated with Wall Street swings, leverage your 401ks and IRAs to substantially increase the return on your investment, and do all of this with turnkey, hands-off passive real estate investments, then you'll want to immediately go to stetalker.com forward slash webinar. In the webinar, we'll also address the common dubious investment schemes that you want to avoid. To access the webinar, go to stetalker.com forward slash webinar. I look forward to seeing you in the webinar. Thank you for tuning in to Real Estate Investing Abundance brought to you by Steve Talker Capital a company working for passionate professionals like you to develop financial independence built on solid, passive real estate investments. 
As part of our efforts to make the world a better place, Steve Talker Capital contributes to activities and organizations committed to better understand the equine. These endeavors attempt to enhance the human treatment of horses worldwide. Steve Talker Capital, working for a world where all creatures, great and small, flourish abundantly. For resources to develop your financial independence, connect with us at stevetalker.com.